try and make it quick. Okay, my name is Herman Chinrihesi. I'm the chairman of the Soft Tribe. Uh, the Soft Tribe is a software company based out of Accra, Ghana. I'm going to give you a bit about, about what I've been doing over the last 10, 15 years and what my vision is for Africa using technology. Good. Now, um, went to school at University in America, left three weeks after I graduated. I was totally convinced that given the underdevelopment in Africa, there was no, no, no place in the world with more opportunities because every feature of underdevelopment represented a business opportunity. And this is kind of still my philosophy. I've learned a bit since then, but I still believe that. Now, um, of course, leaving university with no money, not even credit cards, I went back home and I studied manufacturing. Realized that, uh, heck, I don't have any money to set up industry. And I want to work for myself. And realized I had a PC. And uh, the PC, in a certain sense, was a factory. It could make software. So, started developing software, sitting on my bed, in my bedroom at my parents' house. And uh, parents were out of the country, so I had you know, free reign for a couple of years. Now, we sold software, got, got a couple of partners, we sold software, we bought more computers, and sold software, and bought more computers. It's like, heck, this thing is going really well. We did this for 10 years, we wound up with a company that was basically the leading software operation in West Africa. And my partners were very happy, we were sitting in Ghana, and suddenly we got this thing working. We're ten, doubling our turnover every year, and it was wonderful. Now, as a matter of policy, we avoided, given what everybody has said, we avoided uh, any government involvement, no government contracts. We don't want them. That was our attitude. Until 10 years passed, the company was so big, we now employed 70 people, and realized that to sustain what we were doing, the private sector in Ghana was too small. So we did two things. We started exporting into Nigeria, into Togo, into neighboring countries, and we started saying, well, maybe we have to go and face this government by the bullet and face the government sector. And uh, that was the beginning. <laughs> now, firstly, we hit, we started, we couldn't understand what was happening. We had the example, our payroll system was the national standard. Everybody in Ghana used our payroll system, but Ghana government. <laughs> and they had the biggest payroll problem. People, people were paying us anything from $5,000 to maybe $100,000 for our solution. Um, the government had paid 8 million pounds. These, these 8 million pounds were given to, the, to our government by the British government to facilitate this payroll system that wasn't working. And uh, workers on the streets, etc., etc. And we had the solution. And we were offering it for free because it's, a, it's good for our reputation to have done the national payroll because then we could hit, hit other countries. And they weren't taking it. And what was most interesting was the British who had funded this project for eight million pounds used our payroll system for the High Commission. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> you know, so we were, we were very confused. We, had, we thought, oh, we're market leaders, we're innovators, we're Ghanaian, we've got this tropical tolerance thing going, we're building software that can survive, you know, price is good, uh, communication breakdowns it can handle, Power failures, it'll, it'll come back on as soon as the power comes quickly in between the generator and the UPS and the PC. We were experts at this stuff. So we were very, very disappointed. For a couple of years, we actually couldn't believe what was happening. That it wasn't about the software, it was about something else. <laughs> now, for that reason, we had, we had to take it upon ourselves in an arrogant way because we think we know everything and research as to why our company couldn't grow and become like Microsoft. What we found out was mind boggling. Um, what, I'll just give you some of the conclusions of what, what the, the mindset is for us now in terms of moving our business forward. We realized that we still had a colonial economy. There are two kinds of countries. There's, there's the hunter countries that go out and hunt for business in other countries, and there, there's the hunt, hunted countries, and they are just prey. And we realized that we were in a hunted country. <laughs> hunted countries don't have technology companies that are exporting. They have no facilities for managing such a situation. There's no advert on CNN by our government saying, buy Ghana, buy Ghanaian software. It, it, it wasn't designed for that. It was designed to dig gold out of the ground, not they themselves, have an American company dig gold out of the ground, and then everybody takes their percentage. 
that was, that's what it was designed for. And, and we realized that we <laughs> Now, we also realized um, that um, to a certain extent, we always thought, we, we therefore thought these people were evil people. All these, these government official types, they're really evil. But lately, we've come to realize that it's real. If they weren't doing that, what other opportunity exists? What are they going to do? You, you, you go to university, you become some civil servant. Well, is your lot in life to survive on $300 a month for 40 years and die poor? That's not why you went to school. And I've come, we've come to the realization that it's unreasonable to expect that they will sit there and have uh, uh, these monies passing in front of them, uh, and, and they won't take it. It's, it's a totally unreasonable expectation. <laughs> right? So uh, we have to be very practical about it. What we need to do to solve the problems, firstly, is that, you see, the people in the village, the rural folk, who are the majority, can only deal with the world's markets through this small group in the city. And that's the problem. The small group in the city sits around and hopes somebody discovers some new mineral in Ghana. Because that's the only time they make any money. When the, the deal is going through, they take the 10%. And that's their life's, life's uh, earnings. And they're lucky. In my time, oh, the dam was built. Oh, that's when I built my houses and paid my children school fees. In the absence of that, really, what are they going to do? So we figured that there has to be a way to bypass that bottleneck and give power to the rural folk. And in doing our work, we've computerized plantations, we've done all kinds, we've been in the bush doing a lot of work. Then two things happened. The internet came. Wonderful. Now, then the mobile phones came. Internet is spreading. Mobile phones are spreading even faster. Now, the problem we have is that, two things. Why, why are we even bothering with all this? You know, I truly wish we still didn't have to deal with any public sector contracting. I am hoping that people in my part of the world become so rich that I'm busy computerizing somebody's essential oils farm. It's far more convenient. There are less bribes to deal with. There's less hassle. It's more straightforward. So that the ultimate goal is to ensure that people in our countries get wealthy. Uh, uh, people in America don't sit around hoping that one day some Nigerian entrepreneur with money might come and do something in the country, then they'll get rich. No. When, when you have your little factory, <laughs> have your little factory in California, you know there are people in Pittsburgh ordering your stuff. I studied manufacturing, so I have a fair idea of how manufacturing industries work. They're not depending on some, some strange philanthropist from far away or the World Bank to, to come and help them. The people in their country have money. Maybe they don't have billions, but there's a regular stream of you know, $1,000 revenue a day from everybody. That's how, in my view, countries work. It's not about these big bang things. All we need to achieve is that the people in the bush should be able to have a little essential oils farm and make $500 a month. That's all we need to achieve. If we do that, we'll go from something like $500 a year as the earnings of the rural folk to 500 times 12 dollars a year. That's enough. We're rich. It's enough. Then I can go and sell my software the way I was selling it before and have peace of mind. <laughs> this is our aim. Now, I'd like to point out also that, uh, you know, a lot of our people in the diaspora, they leave the country. Why do they leave the country? They cannot face a situation where you're either a, a, a thief or you're dead poor. And, and there are different categories of, of thieves. Um, well, I have to be careful here. Um, I have friends who work with international organizations, and after four years, they come and tell me, Herman, you know, this is immoral. I mean, what they pay me to work in that village <laughs> could really change the, the fortunes of that village. <laughs> and the Toyota Land Cruiser they've given me, really, if I sold it, the problem with the village will be solved. But that's not how the aid is working. I must have a Land Cruiser, and I must be paid my $5,000 a month. And that's how it works. And this, this is the problem that aid can, can uh, constitute. Now, another problem that aid can constitute is we're looking for a big contract in Ghana, my company, and ran into a big problem with the aid group. We, were, we won the bid. Guess who showed up? One of the European countries. We're competing against a company from one of their countries. They walked up and said, hi, um, you know the grant we gave to Ghana government? Good. 
you say our people are too expensive and they've lost the tender, no problem. Use our grant we gave you last year to pay for it. It's now, you know, hi Herman, uh, sorry you won the bid, but you know, hey, they've given us free money, so go to hell. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with my workers? <laughs> What's gonna be, I mean, what does it matter being Ghanaian? <laughs> you see what I mean? So a lot of people leave because of that. Now, ah, another one, point of interest. So when these things are happening, what happens to the local industry? We sit around, and it's like watching a movie. New government in power. Gave the contracts to the German companies. German companies gave them kickback. Kickback funds next election. When you throw democracy into the mix, it makes it even more complicated. Because then they have money for the elections, they win the next election. Not to say democracy is a bad thing, no. I'm just saying what the reality is. Then they will win the next election, because they have the biggest war chest. And then uh, uh, for, the, for the German company, and I'm, not, I'm saying Germany just as a, you know, for the German company, they have their cousins also who need nice holiday type jobs in Africa. <laughs> they all walk in, a whole bunch of, you know, uh, brick, brick layers out of Germany, walk into Ghana, living in first class, $5,000 a month housing, and that kind of thing. Who's paying for this? It's our grandchildren. It's either a loan or a grant. In the, in the event it's a loan, then we are paying for it long term. In the event it's a grant, then I'm sorry for the taxpayers in Germany because the government is giving out money that half of which is going to some African bureaucrat's pocket and the other half is paying for holidays for some of the citizens. It doesn't make sense for any one of us. <laughs> you see, okay, now I'm going to try and talk about the solution. Okay, this is the way I see it. I'm a technology person, I want peace. I want to live a decent life, I don't want to be a thief. I don't want to live outside Africa. It's not dignified for an African, in my view, to spend their whole life working abroad. It's not dignified. <laughs> when, when I go to Europe and I'm hanging out with my European friends, I'm proud that I live in Africa. I'll be embarrassed for them to say, hi, Herman, <laughs> you're back here. Huh? It's not good. <laughs> it's too embarrassing. I can't deal with it. <laughs> they will think I'm irresponsible and, <laughs> and I will, I've left my continent to go to hell and, <laughs> and I'm, I'm in Europe with them. Now, <laughs> so as, as for me, and maybe if there's a horrible war and I'm being shot at or something, I might leave. But for now, I can survive, so I'll stay. But in staying, I have to make sure my children don't have the indignity of being forced to leave. Now, this is the way I see it. We're working on a project that I think is very interesting, and that's what really the main thrust of my thing is I want to discuss with you. We're looking at having, the internet exists, we're looking at having partners, and we are already working on this, who own websites? Where, where's, from the raw, people, raw folk? And I think people really don't want to be on age. They really want to be able to earn their own living. There just isn't a conduit for them to do it. Thank God for the internet, there is now a marketing opportunity, such that organizations can set up, have 3,000 rural people uh, with their wares, pictures of their wares, you know, African hats, African drums, African whatever, uh, medicines, uh, cocoa butter, stuff like that, on display. This has been around for some time. What we think we are adding to the game is a viable payment system. Traditionally, I'm from West Africa, so I've heard about 419. <laughs> for that reason, it's very difficult to have the traditional money movement systems work with us. They're just not Africa friendly. Uh, I've done a business before where after 9-11, all our payment systems were cut. Now, we're working, I can't say everything, but we're working on a payment system that will circumvent that. What that would mean is that if I were a villager in Ghana and I could make African carvings, I could take a day out and go to the nearest city, sign up with some agency, that allows me to put a picture of my whatever, whereas on their site, maybe one dollar a month or something like that, because he'll have tons of them on the site. Then, what happens? Thank God for mobile phones. Even when I'm in the rural area, deep in the bush, I have a mobile phone. At any point, an order can be communicated to me. Delivery dates, which product, when it's expected, et cetera, et cetera. Then, on that date, or near enough, <laughs> realistically, <laughs> I will deliver to a certain point to a freighter 
who will move the product to wherever, Sweden, Kenya, etc., etc. And the payments will come through the system that we're working, which is a text message-based payment system. It doesn't even include, I mean, if we're worried about the, the axis of evil between the governments and the telecoms. It, it runs on the text messaging system, but we are setting up a platform that kind of doesn't necessarily work with. It's just, they just carry our text message. The, the technology of it does not include the telephone company getting into the payments. This is what we're trying to achieve. So African crafts, medicines, music. I was talking to musicians in Ghana. It's a dire situation. They have no access to the global market. They have no way of getting paid. I think that once there's a way to get paid, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, the, the hard, the, the lazy people everywhere, but the hardworking people, the people who can organize themselves, will go out and do what they need to do to access that money. And I think this is what is going to change Africa. Not the aid, not the, you know, the aid has been coming the same way for 50 years. It hasn't made a difference. Clearly the formula is wrong. I think that if the aid group want to help Africans, my personal opinion is that they should work at having the West remove trade barriers. So when we unleash the rural folk, they can actually export. Okay? The other thing I'd like to add for the aid community, you want to help us, take out the subsidies. Spend all your money lobbying against subsidies. Because the next thing we're going to have is African farmers producing because now they can get paid bypassing the government, but they won't be allowed into the markets. They'll be allowed into the markets, but governments in those markets will be subsidizing. That will also screw them up. So these are the two things we need to work on. I think if these things happen, Africa won't need help from anybody. We are resourceful. We are, as individuals, as families, as so-and-so, we'll have our little businesses, we'll run, we'll do our exports, and we won't come to the city. And we won't come and disturb anybody in Europe and America with a visa request. And we'll have peace. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That was amazing. We're going to um, we're take uh, two, two questions for Herman from, from the audience. Uh, does anyone disagree with any? With any let's, maybe from, actually, from, from African members of the audience, I think. Questions, rousing cheers of support. Yes, from, from a mic back here. And then one, one other person, please. Can you see the mic back over here? Mic coming in. That was, that was a provocative talk. Very, very interesting oh, talk. Thank you. That's, that, that payment system sounds yeah, yeah. Uh, And we'll, we'll get rich too. It's not, it's not a charity. <laughs> we'll get very rich. And your children. Yeah. G generational money. Um, Herman, I think your talk was great. And I agree about unleashing the power of the rural people. But I'm a public health doctor. Uh -huh. And the market isn't going to treat the people with HIV. Yes. That's an emergency. So in addition to the two things, I think we also need to deal with that. Okay. Maybe, maybe I'm a bit of a capitalist, but I think money is the solution to everything. The reason why they don't have $800,000 a year doctors in the village is that they ain't got cash. You give them cash, they won't need anything from the government. If they need a school, they will hire teachers and build a school. The beginning of everything for the poor raw folk is cash. You know, the, um, the um, economist uh, 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 Hans Rosling, the TED star who, who's been referred to several times, showed in his famous TED talk analysis of lots of different countries. He did make a, 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 a statement that appears to disagree with that, where he, he compared countries who had focused first on health and those who had focused first on the market. He basically said his conclusion was it's smarter to get healthy first and that that drives wealth rather than the other way around. Uh, it's uh, one man's opinion. I'll tell you where the problem is with that. When you have no cash, you'll be chasing health for about three generations, five generations, 200 years, 300 years, 400. It, you'll never have health. You need cash to buy health. Health is not free. One, one more question. Yeah. The no. mic isn't working. What? Just shout. That's it. All right. That's Herman, it. thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.